Knowing the why in life is important, isn't it? I mean, think about when, when we were kids and we would have to do homework. Or if you have children and they're doing homework, why do I have to do this? This work is stupid. This isn't going to make a... I'm never going to need tri trigonometry in my life. And then you find out, holy smokes, and some things, I actually needed trigonometry in my life. I don't. <laughs> Being honest. <laughs> I pay people that, that, that use it. I'm just kidding. No, because I didn't do it when I was supposed to. <laughs> no. um, but knowing the why for things is so important. And I would encourage all of us to, to, to regularly come back to the things of why do we do the things we do in our life? Why do I make the decisions that I make? Why, why does my family exist? Why does my marriage exist? What is the authority that roots my answer in these questions? See, knowing why gives meaning and purpose to what we're doing. It sustains conviction. If I know why I'm doing something, it will, it will have me move beyond just being excited for something, but fuel me with a deep conviction that I'll walk through whatever to get this done or to live in this way. And it enables endurance. Like I think of my, my wife when I first met her and I was trying to woo her like we're trying to woo the CMA not not really the same type of wooing <laughs> and Tara had a goal of running a marathon she's gonna kill me for sharing this and like to watch her like she she did this program where she started and it was like a five minute jog and then like this whole program that started with can you jog for five minutes and then following this plan like what was it, like right before you ran it, you ran 18 miles, and then you run the marathon. So it started with five minutes, and then ended up where she literally ran the Austin Marathon and ran 20 whatever ungodly amount of miles it's supposed to be. 26.2. But to watch her with this conviction of wanting to, to, you know, to accomplish something, to, 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 to do something that, that proved something to herself, that, that allowed her to have this meaning and purpose, to, to have a conviction that I got to get this done, and to have endurance to do it on times when her knees hurt, long days at work, when things were difficult, when she was like doing six miles and was like, holy cow, I got to do how many more of these? But, it's, but, but I think that's a great picture of knowing our why. And and our why, here, this is what we've been walking through as a church. Why does Missio Church exist? Why did we want to begin to create a new congregation here? And our hope is, is that as we understand our why, that it not only gives us something to live for, but the right why will even give us something worth dying for. And I would submit that that is a far weightier why than even something to live for. And our why, what we, what, what we have been doing over the last several weeks, is highlighting for us that our why rests on what God has revealed to us. In the work he is doing in the world and why he created all things. If, the, if, if a church exists for a man-made why, don't go to that church. Because that's temporary, it's selfish, and it's not enough. But, but if we can go back and say, what did the maker of heaven and earth intend for the things that he made? What is it that he is doing in the world? This is what we want to build our lives on. This is, this is not about doing what we want to do. This is about asking a much bigger question. What is God doing? Why is he doing it? What is it that he wants done? And what does it look like when he begins to get what he wants? So as we look through the, the, the narrative of scripture from Genesis to Revelation, we see a God who is the one that defines why all things exist. This is one of the tragedies of our modern world is we have ripped meaning 
transcendent meaning from, every, any, from everything and made meaning just whatever my heart decides it to be. Which is now devolved into meaning is whatever makes me happy. And if you do something that doesn't make me happy, well, you're doing violence to me and I need to cancel you at all costs. Because we've made the why about me. Look at what that's gotten us. But when, there is a, when we understand that there is a God who made all things and that there is a transcendent truth that, 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 that transcends culture and time and people and, that, that, and that, that we know that that purpose comes from the one who gave life to all things, now we have something we can build on. Therefore, our why here at Missio, our vision statement, Darren talked about it last week, our vision is that Missio Church exists to glorify God by empowering Christ's people, by empowering all of Christ's people to worship him with all of their lives and to give every man, woman, and child repeated opportunities to respond to the gospel. There are three aspects to this why that is rooted in his word. This is what we've been walking through the last few weeks. The first aspect of this is the glory of God. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. We see it all throughout the scriptures that God made all things to the praise and honor of his glory. Everything was made from him, it was made through him, and it is all to him. And so we don't want to be a church that just builds a name for ourselves. We don't just want to be a church that comes in and says, hey, Darren and I's goal is just to make people feel really good about themselves so they can go on with their week. Because if you're the center of what we're trying to do, we're actually doing you a disservice. Instead of connecting you to the one who is all satisfying, we're going to try to tickle you so that you'd be satisfied for a moment. We exist for the glory of God. Number two, the second aspect is God's people. God, we're going to talk about this. He is on a mission redeeming a people back to himself. And that those people who, are, who belong to him, who were bought and purchased by him, were not only restored back to the God who made them, but then their image is restored in the world and being restored in the world to actually begin to live out the purposes for which he originally created us to live. And so we want to help be a part of God's work in the world to see all of Christ's people live their whole lives for the glory of that God. And then the third aspect is this idea of God's mission in the world. And today we're going to focus on God's mission. And for that, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 7. Now I know some of you were like, Revelation? So you're going to bring out a big giant chart with seven blood moons? You will never see that here at Missio. <laughs> I know that the book of Revelation can often be an intimidating book. There's a lot of misconceptions about the book of Revelation and a lot of misconceptions on TV about the book of Revelation. But the book of Revelation was really given as a tremendous gift from God to his church. And I love what G.K. Beale, who is one of the leading theologians of the book of Revelation, the way he writes a summary for why Revelation was written, and it's this, it was written as an ultimate battle cry of victory to God's people who endure a broken, hostile world where we will suffer, there will be hardship, there will be things going on that are in some degree seem like they are tectonic plates, that we are just these small little things walking on that are colliding and moving, and it looks as if evil is completely running rampant, and that evil is the one that wins the day. But what we actually see in Revelation is no 
Christ rules and he reigns over all of that evil. In fact, he is actually using that evil for his own purposes and for his own glory. He is not the cause of that evil. But he is so good that he's the only one that can take evil, shame, and suffering and bring about something good from it. So he rules and he reigns at the beginning of Revelation. He rules and he reigns through the middle of Revelation. And he rules and he reigns at the end of Revelation, showing that God's purposes will be worked out in the world. And you, church, can find great hope in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your hardship, because history is going somewhere. And you as his people have a great hope awaiting for you. That's why Revelation was written. And so Revelation opens in chapter 1. Well, first of all, the Revelation was written by John the Apostle. John was one of the 12 apostles that followed Jesus for three years of his life. He was, one, he was the only apostle that was at the foot of the cross and watched Jesus die in front of him. This is the same apostle that from the cross Jesus looks at John who is next to his mother Mary. And Jesus says, woman, behold your son. Son, behold my, your mother. In other words, John, take care of my mom. I'm entrusting her to you. It's that John. John is older in life. He, is, he has been persecuted. He has suffered tremendous hardship in his life and ministry. It's the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, that, were, that wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he is now writing Revelation from this island called Patmos, and Patmos was a prison island. He was sent to Patmos to die. It was a desolate, terrible place. And while he is there, God gives him the book of Revelation. Revelation, God, it is the revelation of Jesus. God is revealing something to us about Jesus. Revealing something to the world about how, how God through the Son is reconciling all things to himself. And it starts with John seeing this vision of Christ. And what's interesting about this early revelation is that John is the same John that was very close with Christ prior to his death on the cross. So much so that he sat next to him and said he reclined into him. He was known as the one whom Jesus loved in his gospel. But when he sees this vision of the resurrected Christ now... If you read Revelation 1, it says, when I turned and I saw this glorious, unbelievable Savior whose eyes were like flames, whose feet were like burnished bronze and incredibly glorious, when he spoke, it was with the rumble of many waters rushing. And it said, when I saw him, I fell as if I was dead at his feet. Never think that Jesus is this far-off surfer dude that, that is kind of, uh, you know, amorphous. Is he male? Is he female? He's kind of weak. He's kind of... No, he is the resurrected king of kings and lord of lords. That it caused even John the apostle to go, holy smokes, I can't be here. But Jesus, in his mercy, looks at him and says, you don't have to be afraid. You're right to be afraid, but you don't have to be. Fear not. And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I hold the keys to death, life, and Hades. And I want you to write down everything I'm about to tell you. I want you to write down everything you're about to see. And the first thing that he has John do if we read Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is... John writes seven letters to seven churches that were given by Christ to these churches. And the grand theme of these letters are, church, hold to me. Hold to me. I know, hard, I know it's hard. I know suffering is coming. Don't wander away into lies. Hold to me. Remain faithful to me. Because I am always faithful to you. And then we get to chapters 4 and 5. Chapters 4 and 5, God takes the church and he lifts their eyes to the very throne room of God. And what we see in 4 and 5, it's like, you, you know when you're a parent and your kid gets hurt or, or you see somebody that's hurt and you just want to kneel down, you want to grab their face and you want to say, look at me. Mom and dad are right here, everything's okay. 
It's like this is what God is doing to the church. He's grabbing our face gently and saying, look at me. And in chapter 4 and chapter 5, we get this incredible view of God on his throne. And all creation worshiping him. And all the myriads of angels worshiping him. You see that he is perfectly, permanently, forever fixed on his sovereign throne. Uh, working his purposes and his will in the world that we don't need to fear because God is. And we see all glory and honor being given to God the Father. And then as we move to chapter 5, we see the same honor that is given to the Father being given to the Son. And there is this tremendous moment in Revelation 5 where John sees one that was like a, a lamb who was slain. By the throne. And this lamb is Jesus who was slain, and though he lives. And then by the throne, there's this scroll that comes out. And this scroll has seven seals on it. And this is a powerful moment. And it says, and, and, and what, what we see is, is it says, it, uh, so, so if you read in Revelation 5, verse 6, it says, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns, meaning all powerful, with seven eyes, meaning omniscient and sees and knows all things, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And this scroll that was handed out, it was asked, Who can take this scroll? And open it. And this scroll represents the will of God being done in the world. The plan of God's will being done in the world. And what we read in Revelation 5 is no one can. No one can do what God wants done in the world. And it causes John to weep. But what we see is that the Lamb of God is the only one who can take the scroll. He is the only one that can accomplish what God wants done in the world. And what he wants done is to bring salvation and to bring judgment. One of the primary themes of scripture is God's glory being seen in salvation through judgment. Does that make sense? For example, think of when the water parted in Exodus. And God brought salvation to his people through the pathway that he created in the Red Sea. But that same path that brought salvation, guess what it also did? It brought judgment on the enemies of God as they tried to walk through that same path. And God covered them up and destroyed his enemies. In the same way, Christ comes and he brings salvation. He accomplishes the will of God on the earth. He accomplishes it perfectly. And he brings salvation through his death on the cross and his victorious resurrection, and yet also in that he is also the God that brings just judgment on the earth to purge it of the cancer that has destroyed it all. So we get into chapter 6, and Jesus begins to open this scroll, one seal at a time. And what we see basically is this, is that, that as these seals are being opened, that chaos is reigning on the earth. Deception, wars, pestilence, famine, all of these things creating hardship in the earth. All the things that we are living in the midst of every day. Believer, Christians are suffering. Non-believers are suffering. But what we see is that God, through Christ, is working out his purposes even through all of that suffering. That through the suffering that we all go through, here's what Revelation 6 tells us. God is bringing judgment on those that aren't his. And God is purifying those that belong to him. And he rules and reigns through it all. And as Revelation 6 continues to go on, we see that at the end of chapter 6, as the sixth seal is open, that this is pointing to the final day when the Savior really comes back. And it's this amazing moment where there's a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as fig tree sheds its winter fruit and it's shaken that the sky vanished 
like a scroll that was rolled up and every mountain and island was removed and then the kings of the earth and the great ones and all these powerful people at the coming of Christ, they tremble in fear because as Christ returns as a judge, it causes those great and small to be terrified. And at the very end of chapter 6, it says, for the, for the great day of the world's wrath has come. Who can stand? You ever ask yourself that question? I'm taking time to build this because we need to have a holy understanding of who God is. And he is not a God to be trifled with. He is not a God that we make into our own image. He is not the God that's just there to make us feel better about life. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one who holds death and life in his hands. He is the God who works even over the evil powers of the world to bend them so that the fruit of that work actually brings him glory. And one day, every single one of us will stand before this God. And the question that's being asked is, who can actually stand before him? Who has the pure character, unblemished, that can stand before God and go toe-to-toe and go, I deserve to be here? What Revelation 6 says is, honestly, nobody. Nobody. Because God is not there to judge between man and man. There are some better than others, right? I mean, there are There's Packer fans in the world, Andy. (laughs) There's Viking fans in the world. I'm just kidding. But yet, we get into chapter 7. And there's this parenthesis in the middle of this being told. This, This kind of crescendo of, oh my gosh... Things are progressing. Things are getting... Jesus is going to come back and he is going to wage holy war and rid the world of sin and sinners. Who can stand? Chapter 7 comes. And it's almost like God says, take a breath. Take a breath for a minute. Let's step over here. I'll answer that question. Who can stand? And this is what we read in chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Press pause for a minute. So here's how this opens up. So in Revelation chapter 6, we see that as Jesus is opening the first four seals, these things that are called these riders on the, the four horsemen are, are let out. And these four horsemen are symbolic. They're, they're literal symbols of demonic activity going on in the world to deceive us from truth, to cause war and division, to bring illness and, and calamities and hardship and, and all the things that just stir this world up to be broken is going on, and it's causing harm, and it's causing chaos, and it's causing hardship, and it's causing Christians to die, and people to suffer, and to wander off, and to hate one another, and and, I mean, we're coming out of a pandemic. Do we not think that's true, right? And yet, what we see in chapter one, in this parentheses, is it starts off with these four angels who have come from God, standing at the four corners of the earth. The four corners of the earth means the entire known world. So throughout the entire earth, there are these angels that God has given that have authority to do something, and their authority is to hold back the four winds of the earth so that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. The four winds of the earth, if we look at other Old Testament passages, means that the four winds of the earth 
is synonymous with the four horsemen. In other words, this is all the evil of the world, the evil of the nations, all of the demonic activity that seeks to cause harm and death and division and hardship. Hold those back, angels. Hold those back. Restrain them so they are not operating unrestrained. Because God's doing something in the world. Now, this restraining is only temporary. Notice how it says this. That fifth angel comes from the throne, and he says, hold them back until. Until what? Until all of God's people are sealed with his name on their foreheads. This is what is being told in all of the turmoil, in all of the hardship, in all the things that God is doing, God is restraining evil. Believe it or not, evil is restrained now. We catch glimpses of evil not being restrained in the moments of like the Holocaust or, or the evils of Rwanda in the 90s. Sometimes we catch glimpses of the evilness of our own heart, but even that's restrained now. Because God is doing something in the world where he's fulfilling the promise he gave to Abraham. I'm going to create a people that are going to bless the whole earth. And I'm going to create a people for myself, which will be as numerous as the stars of the sky. And so evil will be restrained. Yes, it will. Yes, I will use it. Yes, it will have some effect on the world. But in the midst of that, I'm restraining it because I am sealing a people for myself. And what we learn in these verses, and don't miss this, the scriptures tell us that this, that history hinges on God's glory shown in the salvation of his chosen people. History hinges on God redeeming a people for himself. Even as his mighty judgment is falling on his enemies. The suffering of the world is intent to kill you, but God is using it as a warning that ultimate judgment is coming and to purify a people for himself. This is what human history is all about, God redeeming a people for himself. This is what the angel is saying. And as every single person that is chosen before the foundation of the world comes to Christ and says yes to Jesus, their forehead is sealed with the name of God. God says, mine. I've purchased that. I'm putting my name there. He or she belongs to me. Come to me. And I will hold you. And my seal will mark ownership. My seal will mark protection. My seal will mark that you have a great hope awaiting for you. Don't fret the hardships of life. But I'm using it for your good. I'm using it for my glory. And that does not have the final word for you. History hinges on God's glory shown in the salvation of his chosen people. And then he goes even further. And now we see this numbering of the, church, uh, of the people of God. Verse 4, and I heard the number of the seal, the 144,000 sealed from the tribe of the sons of Israel. And then you see this, 12,000 from Judah, from Reuben, from Gad, from Asher, from Naphtali. Here's what that means. There are two ways to interpret this. One, it's actually ethnic Israel, where some end times theology believes that there's only going to be 144,000 ethnic Jews saved after what is called the Great Tribulation. But if we understand the real narrative of scripture, here's what this passage is saying. The church is Israel. And every single person that God has chosen to be saved will be saved. And not one will be missing. If you have been chosen to belong to your God, you will make it to the end. He has counted you He knows you, he has sealed you, and he will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. He has taken a census of his people, and he is now getting what he purchased. See, Christ's death on the cross 
accomplished 100% of what he intended it to accomplish. Not one person that he sent to, to, to save will be lost. Not one person that belongs to this will be forgotten. And then we move on. So after he sees that God's people are protected, that history is God redeeming a people for himself, and not one of them will be missing, now we go into chapter, or into verse 9. And after God gives him this vision, now he looks and he says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the living creatures, and they fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and might, Be to our God forever and ever. Now we get a closer look into who these people are. This people that God is redeeming to himself, that he has numbered every single one of them. And here's what we see, that God's people are from every ethnic group throughout the earth. At the end of days, when all of God's people are standing before the throne from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation, and it's this giant multitude, I can just imagine God turning to Abraham and going, see, I did it. That promise I gave you, it's done. You can't even count them. And look, they're from every every family of the earth is represented here. Because this is what I'm doing in history. I'm redeeming a people for myself through my son that I'm lifting higher than every name. I'm, I'm, I'm protecting you. I'm holding you. I will keep you to the end. I will not lose one of you. And I will accomplish that my people will be from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation of the earth. And then... And then he looks, and, and, and I love where, where the, this, this elder that's kind of walking with John through this vision as a tour guide, so to speak. He turns and he looks to John and he says, hey, who, are, who is this multitude of people? And I love John's answer. He's like, dude, I have no idea. <laughs> I love it. He's like, you know. <laughs> You're the guide here, not me. <laughs> right? And then he said to them, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation." They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes." Here's what we see in this, is that God says those are the people that belong to Jesus. From every tribe, every tongue, every nation, that's what history has been all about, redeeming that bride. And they will will always dwell secure in the presence of their shepherd. And so we see that history hinges on God's glory being shown in the salvation of his people. They are from every ethnic group throughout the earth and that his people live forever secure in the great hope of Christ. So we need not fear calamity. So what does this mean for us as a church? Number one, we want to exist to be faithful to God's mission and redeeming people back to himself. That begins right here in Ringgold County. That begins with the 21 counties of Iowa, and in our nation, and in our world. We want to be about this work, unashamedly, releasing every resource we can. Number two, that Missio Church will do this in partnership with the broader body of Christ. No church can do this alone, no matter how big. But we are a part of that multitude I love what Christopher Wright says, that the whole Bible itself is a missional phenomenon. The Bible renders to us the story of God's mission through God's people and their engagement with God's world for the sake of the whole of God's creation. And number three, 
that we want to strive to faithfully proclaim the gospel. For it is the power of God to save all those who believe. Guys, there are churches in our own town that want to give a message different than the gospel. That is not the hope for the world. The hope of the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other message that can save. There is only one message the world needs to hear and and to see it put into action, and it's the gospel. That is the only hope for humanity. There is no hope outside of the resurrection of Jesus. So what does this then mean for you? Number one, I pray that all of us here have trusted in and followed Jesus. That you are a part of this multitude. Number two, that you see and live life through the lens of Scripture and not some other worldview. That you are on God's mission with all of us together and that you share the great hope of Christ beginning with those closest to you. We do this together. You have a part to play because it is all a part of what God is doing in history. This is why we exist. I know I've gone a little long. I'm going to stop now, but I want to finish with one one thing. My father passed away three years ago. And I'll never forget sitting by his bedside two weeks before he died. And I was the first one to become a Christian in my family. And I remember my dad wanted nothing to do with what I was doing. And I had an opportunity over years of witnessing to him that he came to Christ and I got to baptize him in the Gulf of Mexico. It was one of the greatest points of ministry in my life. And I remember sitting by his bedside and I knew this was going to be the last time I would ever talk with my father. And I rejoice with the fact that the last thing we talked about was his hope in Christ. That he will see Jesus and he was on the clock to the moment when he would see him. And on the day that he passed, and I still grieve him horribly to this day. And yet my grief is not without hope. Because he's where I long to be. This is not about getting people to come to a service. This is about proclaiming a message of hope and life to to, to no longer fear when God will come because who can stand before the living God? Last thing, I promise I'll be done. I'm sorry, I'll be done. I'll be done. Look at verse 9 at this multitude. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne of God. The people redeemed by Jesus can stand before the living God. We are messengers of hope. Forgive my length. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of your Son and God. There is so much more that we could say in regards to what you're doing in the world. And I spoke too long. And God, I pray that you forgive any frivolity that I have said. But God, I do pray that we would be a church that is on a singular mission. With a singular message of life for this community in this world. That we would be a people who faithfully proclaim your message. And that each one of us would be individual persons that are on that mission as well. May it all be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.